good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Baker Institute this evening. We are truly delighted to have uh, one of Turkey's most distinguished uh, diplomats uh, at our institute. Uh, during his visit uh, to Turkey in April 2009, uh, President Barack Obama called Turkey a critical ally, and he cited the importance of pursuing common goals between our two countries. Cooperation between the United States and Turkey within NATO, as well as U.S. support for Turkey's membership in the European Union, are just two major examples. Uh, Turkey is continuing to strengthen its democratic processes, as seen by the fair and free elections which occur there. This will prove important in regard to Turkey's ties with Europe and Turkey's long-stated goal of becoming a member of the European Union. In successfully addressing the region's many challenges, a robust U.S.-Turkish relationship is crucial, in my view. In many ways, the responsibilities of Turkey's leaders at the present moment are truly substantial. As the ambassador told a group of Rice students today, <laughs> the obvious Turkey lives in a very, very dangerous neighborhood, as witnessed by the events that we're seeing on television today in Egypt, uh, Tunisia, and the region. Geography is destiny. And Turkey is not only at the crossroads of Europe and the broader Middle East, but as its leaders state, it occupies a central geopolitical space in the region as a whole. As it has in the past, geography will continue to provide Turkey many challenges, as well as opportunities in the coming years. Turkey's foreign relations in the region have been at the forefront of its recent diplomacy, particularly through Foreign Minister Ahmed Davutoglu's policy of zero problems with neighbors. This is significant. Turkey, for example, has played a pivotal part in mediating current Middle East disputes, especially between Syria and Israel, and achieved uh, quite a bit of success. And it has developed important relations with Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Central Asian states, and the Caucasus, and beyond. In addition, positive steps have been taken in the recent past toward normalizing relations between Armenia and Turkey. Of course, much work needs to be done on all of these fronts, but Turkey's role is pivotal. Our distinguished speaker this evening has much more to say on these and important subjects. You have his CV in your program. I'm not going to repeat it. I'll just highlight. He has a law degree from Ankara University. He began his diplomatic career by joining the Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs in 1982. You're a very young man. <laughs> As noted in your program, he has served many prestigious posts, including Deputy Chief of Cabinet to the Turkish President and Chief of Cabinet to the Turkish Minister. Since February of 2010, he has been Turkey's ambassador to the United States, a very important post, obviously, given the relationship. Uh, he also uh, served previously as Turkey's ambassador to Israel from 2007 and 2009. In this case, we both have served our countries as ambassador to Israel. So I guess we belong to a special club of survivors of one of the most challenging posts a diplomat can have and one of the most interesting. I've received many favorable comments in the ambassador's service in Israel. So please join me in welcoming Ambassador Namik Tan, ambassador of Turkey to the United States. Well, they say a speech is like a lady's skirt. It should be long enough to cover all the subjects, but it should also be short enough to display all the beauties. <laughs> so you choose. But um, I'll be brief, then try to answer your questions if you, if you happen to have any. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the Consular Corps in Houston, fellows of the Baker Institute, members of the Rice University, distinguished guests, I am delighted to be here with you today at the Baker Institute. It is a distinct pleasure for me to address this academic gathering in one of this great nation's celebrated universities. I am impressed and gratified by the strong interest of the audience to this event. 
Let me first thank to the organizers of this gathering. First and foremost, Ambassador Jerejian, the founding director of the Institute and one of the giants of American diplomatic history. And just to take a moment and say a few more words about him, he was telling about the correlations or the similarities in our uh, backgrounds, CVs. And I was so much honored to, for him making such a, such a uh, remark about my career, because uh, it's always nice uh, to hear such words from a legend. He is a living legend, not only in Turkey, uh, not only in the United States, but globally is a legend. So a legend sitting uh, here uh, as, as, uh, as the founding director of this institute, you should take uh, the most, uh, uh, I think, uh, pride of uh, all frights. Um, of course, uh, my words cannot properly describe his contributions to the world of diplomacy. His child, Baker Institute, takes pride as one of the leading academic institutions, ranking high among other competitors, drawing researchers from across the United States, as well as 83 foreign countries. The academic body is vibrant with impressive cred credentials. It is thus no coincidence that Baker Institute has attained a well-deserved place in less than two decades. I am confident that the Rice University and the Baker Institute are destined to become one of the success stories in the years ahead. And I would like to thank uh, uh, the President for taking time and being with us tonight. And thank you, sir, for, for uh, caring to listen to what I'm gonna, gonna say uh, tonight. Uh, now let me turn to the course of my speech. Today, I would like to talk about Turkish-American relations in the new century. In this frame, I would like to offer a perspective on the salient features of the Turkish-American relationship. I will start by being frank with you about this otherwise excellent strategic partnership. Since I assumed my duties last year as the Turkish ambassador to the US, I have been devoting most of my time and efforts to addressing some very difficult issues. I have to admit that it was an exciting and, yes, challenging year. But the challenges we faced last year were not at first in our long-standing relationship with the US. This is my third tour in this country. And I have witnessed many ups and downs in the years that I served in this beautiful country. What makes the partnership between our countries unique is its resilience, even in the face of difficulties. Because of the foundation of our relationship, built carefully and diligently over decades, it is strong and stable. Turkey and the US have shown the ability to rise above differences and focus on the big picture every time they have been confronted with an obstacle. That's what makes a successful relationship. As a true friend and admirer of the US, I should say in all candor that I find it disappointing to see many observers of our relationship question Turkey's intentions and direction in foreign policy. To that, I would like to make one thing very clear. Turkey is not going anywhere. Turkey has been solidly anchored in its current place among the community of nations. It is and will long be a reliable bridge that binds the civilizations and the cultures to its east and west, as well as north and the south. I will argue that the growing skepticism in this country towards Turkey 
stems from a debate based on perceptions and driven by symbols and stereotypes. I hasten to add that the same is true of how the U.S. is viewed in Turkey. Because the parties tend to look at each other through the prism of symbols. Intentions on both sides are vulnerable to misinterpretations. Turkey's growing interest in its immediate neighborhood and its increasing influence in the region are often viewed by critics here as a search for an alternative to its current, current allegiances and pulling away from our long-lasting alliances with the West. Unfortunately, those, those critics pay less attention to the dynamics in Turkey that are driving our very active and dynamic engagement in regional and international affairs. Today, Turkey is the 16th largest economy in the world and the sixth biggest economic power in Europe. It is a stable democracy that is nevertheless constantly working to raise the standards of our democratic institutions. The combination of these two factors, rising economic strength and the stability and steady improvement of our democracy, has increased Turkey's eagerness and capability to build an environment of stability and prosperity in our region. In this respect, we are trying to achieve something that our Western allies have pursued in our region for decades. Turkey's time has come to join them, side by side, in that noble and necessary enterprise. When assessing Turkey's uh, policies, one has to bear in mind we leave, that we live in one of the most turbulent areas of the world. I think you wouldn't be located in such a neighborhood. If you take a moment and think of what we have around us. Just take a moment and think. Uh, it's not like United States with two peaceful countries in the north, Canada and Mexico, and two oceans. It's not the case. Most of the potential and real threats that factor in the Western world's security assessments take place on Turkey's doorsteps. NATO has identified 16, 16 major uh, conflicts which would threaten the world peace and stability. And most of them are around us. You should know this. Whatever happens around us has direct and usually immediate bearing on Turkey's political, economic, and social well-being. Our recent history is fraught with the adverse repercussions from turbulence and instability in our region. Not only that, Turkey had troubled periods of its own in recent decades, and I am pleased to say we have overcome those tensions and put them far behind us. What is happening today in the Middle East, as late as today, as we all are witnessing, Central Asia or the Horn of Africa, that is a source of real concern for the US, is a bigger concern for Turkey. Because we are closer to all of these travel spots. We are not 10,000 kilometers away, like yourself to all those trouble spots. We feel the first and strongest ripples that radiate from trouble spots and can, in this age of global interaction, touch people even more distant lands. That proximity has an enormous influence on the policies we pursue to ensure stability and peace in our region. Unfortunately, discussions on Turkey in the U.S. mostly overlook factors like these that drive our policies. 
Maybe that's because so much of what goes on in Turkey is, even too many well-informed analysts, a little mysterious or not readily understandable from a distance of thousands of miles. For that reason, my job is to offer an accurate interpretation to Americans to help them better understand what's happening in Turkey. My counterparts representing the US in Ankara have the same task. My task is also to urge Turks and Americans alike to look beyond the differences and avoid focusing on stereotypes and abstractions. That will make it be easier to appreciate the co countless common objectives and interests of, of our uh, two countries share. We have to set aside our differences and focus on what we have gained so far from the strategic relationship between our countries and what the future holds for us. The similarities between Turkey and America outweigh the differences. The US and Turkey have powerful and functioning market economies. We are both strong democracies based on universal values such as human rights, rule of law, and respect for cultural as well as religious pluralism. Furthermore, we have in the past fought side by side and spilled blood for protection, uh, uh, for protecting our shared values from many formidable enemies who were threatened by the promotion of these fundamental principles. Today, we uphold the very same values as two prominent NATO allies engaged in important struggles in Afghanistan and in other unstable lands. Over the years, our world has undergone an immense transformation. We, the members of the free world, prevailed against the forces of tyranny. Despite the significant strides we have taken in our quest to build a safer and more prosperous world, we are still confronted with serious challenges and target our way of life, that target our way of life and the values for which we stand. Today, the perils before us are of a different and more complex nature. Therefore, we can no longer tackle the challenges as we have in the past. We need, to, we need new tools and a revised approach. The strategic partnership today between Turkey and the US is more essential than ever to meet the needs of our still young century. However, in order, in order to be more effective in our endeavors, we need a more interactive and complementary spirit of cooperation. In that regard, Turkey will always pro pro provide its input which is shaped by its own experiences, as well as its cultural and historical background. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, as much as I deeply value the Turkish-American friendship, I am disappointed by the plummeting popularity of the US in Turkey. But I can assure you that this lack of sympathy does not point to a consistent pattern of, uh, in our relations. And it is fairly easy to redress. In 1999, in the wake of the devastating earthquake in, in Turkey, a caring hug by the ex-president uh, ex Bill Clinton of a baby whose family was left homeless due to the disaster boosted the support of the Turkish people to America. Recently, when President Obama was elected to office, his message of engagement understanding and tolerance once again resulted in a surge of the US popularity, not only in Turkey, but throughout the world. All it takes is a simple human touch, a sign of respect for the concerns and considerations of others. We must therefore bolster the level of understanding of each other. To that end, Turkey is stepping up its efforts to explain the reasoning behind the policies it pursues, which, which raise question marks in the US. 
On the other hand, as opinion makers and leaders of this country, you also have a crucial role in reaching out to your counterparts in Turkey. As I have just mentioned, gestures usually result in big accomplishments. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I encourage you to take the long view in your examinations of this fascinating country, together with very many valuable aspects of the Turkish-American relations that will remain pivotal in the 21st century, just like in the past century. The Turkish-American friendship, partnership, and alliance will stand resolved to brace new challenges and testing times as in the past. Yet, our relations will demand constant attention and creative thinking in an ever-growing pace. As future is in our hands to shape, the future leaders will come to bear this exclusive responsibility. I am confident that both Turkish and American future leaders will not hesitate to come forward in assuming this noble task. Thank you for your keen attention, and I will now be pleased to take questions if you have, happen to have any. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. The floor is now open uh, to questions. Okay, uh, Judy first, and ladies before gentlemen, and then Chase. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, you mentioned uh, living in a uh, unfortunate neighborhood, perhaps. What are the two countries that you're most worried about, and why? <clears throat> in that neighborhood? Yes. It would be quite undiplomatic for me to name names, uh, uh, as you could understand. <laughs> um, but uh, maybe you can, uh, I mean, first of all, it's not two. I wish it was two. It were only two countries, uh, uh, to say the least. We have quite a few of them. And I can assure you what comes to your mind in, in making a list would immediately come to my mind as well. So make your own judgment. <laughs> look around. Look, look around and <coughs> see, see the countries. Start from wherever you like, clockwise or counterclockwise. <laughs> you are a diplomat. <laughs> well, can you talk about the Kurd problem and is it a problem and what are, you know, give us a little... Which problem? The Kurd. The Kurd? The Kurd? Uh-huh. Uh, well, uh, um, Kurd problem, uh, there is... Uh, I, I shouldn't say that there is... Uh, uh, it is. It's a, it's a very interesting uh, uh, phrase that you put, Kurd problem. Kurd cannot be a problem uh, itself, uh, I think. Or uh, let's say... Uh, the, uh, some of the complications which emanate from uh, the, the Kurds living in that neighborhood. Uh, of course, uh, today, Kurds are living in different countries. Uh, they live in Turkey, they live in Iran, they live in Syria, they live in Iraq. So the next, next thing that you should do is just try to check into whether which one of them enjoying the democratic values that we all cherish, the values that we have in our country. Let's go one, one, one. Accountability, trust, transparency, tax, rule of law, such kind of things. In which country they enjoy this? <coughs> Let's start thinking again, over and over again. Turkey? Is it Turkey? Or is it Iran? Or is this Iraq? Or is it Syria? So, it is Turkey. 
democracy is is the nicest of all regimes, but it's very difficult to sustain. It is difficult. You can take pride of your democratic experience. We have had our own, but it took a while for us to create this democracy, democratic values. It still is not complete, our experience even. So I think there is a great future for our Kurdish uh, friends and citizens all around the country. Today, there are 600, more than 600 companies investing in, in northern Iraq. 600 Turkish companies. If you cross the border from the southeast of Turkey into Iraq, <coughs> Kurdish region, regional uh, area, you cannot, uh, I think, feel like you are crossing into a foreign country. It's like changing neighborhoods. It's so Turkish. Why is that? Ask the Kurds, I mean, ask them, if they see their future in another direction or through Turkey. I once asked this to Mr. Talabani. Don't quote me on that. He said, the question was simple, sir, would the Kurds of Iraq today like to be independent? He said, well, if you go and ask uh, any individual Kurd anywhere, of course they would say yes. We want an independent country. But we know how costly it is to try to get that point. So it's not quite logical for us to aspire for it. We have the simplest way, he said. Our destiny is together with Turkey, not with Syria, not with Iran, not with uh, 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 any other country, not with even Iraq, he said. You know, Again, don't quote me on that. But uh, he said this is Turkey. Why he said this? Because of uh, the fact that our eyes are, are towards west. Chase. Ambassador Tan, the ruling party of Turkey is often described as Islamist. Yes. Uh, what does it mean to be Islamist in Turkey? And does this represent a turning away from the traditional Kemalist principles that have governed before? A very good question. Thank you for that. It requires a little, um, uh, actually, political uh, uh, connotation when answering this question. But uh, uh, let me tell you this. Uh, first and foremost, there is no such thing like Islamist or um, this and that. Uh, uh, and even once in this country, they said moderate Islam. Some call it light Islam. Some call it liberal Islam. There is one Islam, ladies and gentlemen. You cannot qualify Islam in any other way. Islam, Islamic rules are there, set and indefinite. You cannot play with that. You cannot qualify. However, that's the challenge that we have taken. This country, is a conservative country, mostly. Can you say United States or qualify United States otherwise? This is also a conservative country. So the important thing is that uh, how do you look at the values that, that, that uh, the universal values that we have just enumerated a while ago? How do you look at them? So this present government, uh, they are a conservative government. They are conservative government. But uh, they have their own interpretation of, of uh, uh, things in a more conservative way. But it's nothing to do with religion. Because in Turkey, the constitution is very clear. There is a constitution in Turkey. It says church and state affairs are different. It's a separate 
So no matter which uh, uh, party comes into power, no matter what sort of a policy they, they take, this remains constant. We are a secular country. Um, and moreover, we are a democratic country. If Turks <coughs> are not happy with it, they go to votes, they work for another party. In the Republican history, during the time of democracy, uh, we've always done like that, with certain, or of course, interruptions uh, in the, in, uh, on the way. But we voted for another country, uh, party, and we changed the government. So I think uh, the present government, as I tried to outline in my speech as well, you shouldn't just. Uh, 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 be concerned about the direction of Turkey. Turkey's direction is to the west, to the towards the universal values, to the to, towards the betterment of of, uh, of of all those values that we cherish together. Okay. Let's yes, sir. Follow up on the last question, um, and it ties to the September 12 referendum. We were, my wife and I wanted to meet. Uh, your predecessor, Dr. Farouk Loguglu, yes. uh, in Accra last year, I heard a speech, met with him, and then uh, saw his editorial, maybe you've seen it in the Accra paper, but basically the gist of it was his concern is that the September 12 referendum will open the door to a more concentrated power that would really undermine the principles you talked about, rule of law, transparency, accountability, and his real concern was <coughs> that it was uh, potentially leading to a non-secular non-democratic Turkey. Now, I'm, I'm not espousing, endorsing, or critiquing that, but I would welcome your comments on his view about what the potential is as a result of the new configuration under the referendum. Thank you. Well, it's an excellent question. First of all, uh, Faruk Loğlu is one of the most respected diplomats, and he's uh, one of my mentors. So I have a high respect to him. But he is not a diplomat anymore. <laughs> you should understand this. So in a democratic country, he has every, every reason to say what he thinks. And I think he should, he should value this. Not only him, but I myself and any other uh, of my countrymen should value this. He is able to stand up and say just the opposite to what people say. He says, this country is going to a place where uh, I wouldn't like to see it go. Uh, as I said, he has, that there are certain sect of people uh, in, in our country who think in line with this, with this uh, uh, remarks or uh, interpretation. And I respect them. Uh, however, we have very soon elections. I think on the 12th of June, we will have general elections. This is an opportunity for the people. If they are not happy, they will go and vote for that. And this is, this is the kind of approach we have. Uh, there is no quick fixes, ladies and gentlemen. There, there is no shortcuts. If the people vote for those people, then it means you have to create an alternative, better alternative. If you cannot do this, no one can do it for you. We will do it. And it takes a lot of effort. We will do it. However, presently, this government is there. They're, they're, they're before the people. And they say they are for the people, and they are doing good things. Uh, <coughs> some may be uh, uh, not appreciated. Again, I said, for different reasons, some part of the people will not like them. If, they, if, if this is the case, they go and vote for another party, any other alternative. So this is, this is what it is. Thank you. 
Mr. Ambassador, the last several decades have seen the United States take a leading role in forming Mideast peace policy with varying levels of success. As a rising power in the region, as other than Israel, the only strong democratic institution, what does a Turkish peace plan between Israel and Palestine look like? And how close are we to seeing Turkey take up the ball and being a leading force for that, uh, as opposed to just the United States? It's an excellent, excellent question. Uh, I um, Look, uh, I wish I'm pro proven to be wrong in the future. Just remember this question and my answer. I don't see any future uh, for the so-called Israeli-Palestinian peace deal. I don't see it. Unfortunately, this is the case. This is far ahead of us. I don't know where. When we'll catch it up, we're putting every single effort, you know, uh, into uh, into finding certain solutions to to this. Uh, otherwise, I think, uh, uh, I mean, very difficult, very difficult, very complicated uh, situation. Why? It's not only a political situation. It's not a, a, a only a, a territorial dispute. It is, uh, it's not only some historical you know, differences. It has some religious connotations. When religion enters into this whole game, then you are that. Believe me, and religion and politics, this mix will kill you, will kill any, any, any peace deal. There is no, uh, 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 I think, at least in the immediate future, um, such sophisticated people uh, like Ambassador Jerejian has put a lot of uh, uh, effort throughout his career and still working for it. I mean, one of the finest diplomats that you have here, that we have in the world, and some others of, of uh, really, in quality-wise, next to none, they cannot do anything. This is the first. The second thing is, no problem on the face of the earth is solved by some others. If this problem will be solved, it will be solved between or among the parties. Uh, now we have so many players in the picture. We have everybody. We have Turkey, we have the United States, we have, uh, you name it, I mean, everyone. We have Egypt, we have Jordan, we have this and that. Um, <clears throat> we have so many actors. Uh, too many cooks, you know, most of the time spoil the dish. So. Uh, unfortunately, I, I would love to speak on this uh, subject. It's, it's not a, uh, uh, I mean, it, it cannot be analyzed in, in, in such an instant, uh, through such an instant question. However, we don't have time. Basically, what I can tell you, I think future generations uh, would be, I mean, they will need to focus on this more. And I see no solution, at least in my lifetime, I can tell you. Uh, if things do not get more complicated with the uh, unfolding events that we see around us in Egypt, Egypt is a, the key player in this, in, this, in this equation. The key player, look at what has happening in, in, in Egypt. So it is difficult, it is difficult. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I, what are you hearing within the diplomatic community, kind of building on what you just said, about uh, Turkey's foreign policy um, as it regards uh, Tunisia and, and Egypt and, and kind of what's going on there? Uh, let alone myself. You know, uh, so many other world leaders not I'm not just qualifying my, myself as a world leader but so many other figures you know 
all around the world are, uh, are speechless because uh, uh, it is uh, today it is so much scary you know, to see Egypt falling apart um, there should be at least you know this is my personal uh, perspective but it should be a, a, a sort of a transitional process that we should go go through I mean such instant uh, changes really uh, 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 becomes difficult uh, for all of us. I mean, it stands as a, as, a, as a big challenge. So we are concerned, very much concerned. Now, um, uh, just uh, a while ago, we were discussing uh, with Ambassador Jerejian uh, how much of a big risk that we have uh, now in front of us. Uh, nobody knows how things will develop or which direction you know, develop. Now, I'm unable to say anything to you uh, uh, as, 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 as the policies of my, my, my country. It's, it's too early to, to talk. Uh, however, I can tell one thing, one thing, that, as I said, that what we represent as a country of Muslim orientation, I hope, could be an inspiration to all our friends in that region. That's what I can say. So largely because of Turkey's economic growth as a plate, um, I see it becoming <coughs> an immigration country. It's a destination for newcomers from Western <coughs> Africa to Central Asia. And do you see this influx of people which looks like it has some continuity. Do you see that affecting diplomatic relations? How, how do you envision Turkey adapting its policies to all these incoming relations? Uh, well, the more you put restrictions, the more problems you, you have in front of you. So we're doing just the opposite. We're trying to open up our borders to everyone. So many people criticize us for doing that. They say, how can you let those people into your country? Uh, but uh, when they, they come to our country, of course, they see that living in a democracy is not easy. Uh, so <coughs> if they, they, they have responsibilities, they have rules, <coughs> And we have rules and regulations, we have laws to be observed. If they come and join and add their own color and contribution to our society, they are welcome. If not, they go away. I mean, so uh, today they said you cannot just, uh, uh, I think, lift the visa restrictions with Syria. Uh, we lift it. With Iraq, we lift it. With Iran, we have no visa restrictions. Any Iranian can come and look what happens through this. In a, at any given moment in, 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 in summertime in Turkey, more than one million Iranians are coming to Turkey. 600 something thousand Israelis are coming to Turkey. Two million Russians are coming to Turkey. A couple of hundred thousand people are coming uh, uh, from Western countries. Syrians, about uh, two or three hundred thousand people come to Turkey. What happens? They stay and live in the same resorts. Iranians, Israelis, and Syrians. The three countries, as we all know, they hate each other. I mean, uh, again, this is so undiplomatic, but anyway. Uh, <coughs> so this is the case. What makes them uh, to come to Turkey? Because they feel safe. They, they enjoy their life which they cannot do in their own countries. 
So that's why they come to Turkey. They, they intermingle, they, they uh, you know, enjoy their life and they go back. And even the Iranians at one time stopped the flights. They, they put restrictions to, the, to, to their people to travel to Turkey. Because they come and see the life in Turkey. We have a colorful society. We have every, every type of people, like the United States. Um, so, but they couldn't sustain it. And we didn't do anything, by the way. They had to start it again, because the people wanted. So I think I would advise you never, ever stand before the wishes and wills of the people. If they want to come to Turkey, of course, within the rules and regulations, in an orderly fashion, they should come. Uh, if they want to contribute to our society, they should come. But if they want to create some problems in Turkey, we won't let them in. This will be the last two questions. Mr. Ambassador, you mentioned that you look towards the West for partnership and friendship, but what is, your, what is Turkey's policy towards looking east to the superpowers of India and China, and, and India being a democracy and China not being a democracy? How do you, what, what are the relationships with these two countries, and how do you engage them for the economic prosperity of your own? Uh, well, I said our direction, uh, uh, I, I, because being questioned here in this country, that's why I said the, 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 the argument was that Turkey is turning its back to the West. That I just tried to explain to, uh, uh, to, to this audience, of course, that this, this was not the case. Otherwise, we have, and we have to have a multidimensional pro, uh, foreign policy. We do value our relations with Iran even, because it's, it's a different, sui generis type of relationship, but <coughs> we have to have a relationship with them. Uh, India, India is the largest uh, democracy that we have. Uh, China, an emerging power. Of course, we have, uh, uh, we have to engage with them uh, uh, as much as possible. Russia and on our west. It's an important country. And the, and, the, and the south, we have all African countries. All African countries. So, uh, you know, the, uh, the geostrategic uh, realities <coughs> really compel us in equal manner to, to, to engage with all, all uh, our neighbors and beyond. Of course, the priority is uh, to our neighbors because we, we need to, to create the, 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 uh, the necessary, I think, uh, uh, infrastructure in, in political uh, sense and economic sense, but th then to, to expand it. And one of the, uh, of course, uh, uh, I think, objectives of, of Turkish foreign policy is also uh, building equally uh, important and uh, uh, bigger relationship with India and China, just as we have with the United States. Uh, the distance plays a lot, of course. Last question. Um, Turkey has long historic ties with the nations of Central Asia. What role does Turkey play there today, and what role could Turkey play in helping these nations ease toward transparent democracy after the current leaders are gone? Well, uh, I think um, uh, Central Asian countries, uh, of course, uh, again, that was a question during our discussion uh, with the students. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, Central Asia requires a lot of work, you know. Not only Central Asia in that sense. Uh, again, you're making me, again, to go beyond my 
own uh, you know uh, uh, anyway uh, to, to make me to so much undiplomatic but uh, um, at least don't quote me on that uh, but this these countries uh, the newly independent states uh, uh, there is no mentality change why I explained in the, in, the, in the same words to, to our students Democracy is not an instant coffee that you pour into a cup and stir it a little bit and drink, be it democrat. This is not, there is no such thing. Just like the biggest of all mistakes probably for United States in its military intervention in Iraq, look at the complications that we are facing now, uh, unfortunately. Uh, we're still working together with the United States. What was the objective? What was the uh, argument? Bringing democracy to Iraq. There is no democracy culture there. Uh, how can you bring democracy into a country where some you know, particular people, again, I don't want to name names. So the same is true for centralizing countries. We've got a lot of work to do together. We are trying to be, to inspire them, to, 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 to set an example for them. Uh, we, we give them, we, we have an engagement uh, with all of them, without any exception. And they trust us, at least. This is a good thing. So to a certain extent, of course, uh, the trust. Uh, but we are trying to make uh, some good things out of this trust and engagement. I said that was the last question, but uh, my wife wants to ask a question. Okay. <laughs> and uh, in, in order to help save my marriage, uh, <laughs> I'm going to this give her the great. floor. Make it short. <laughs> this is great. Ambassador, because I think to end on the on the note that is maybe more positive for for our bilateral connections. I see in my crystal ball that with everything that's happening in the region, your region, that the United States government is going to have to rely much more on a, on a harmonious and productive relationship with Turkey, and that your role is going to be enhanced. Yes. And, and that, that's what I see. Do you agree with that? Uh, is that not the wife of a diplomat? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great ending. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, it wouldn't be fair and objective if I say yes to this. Uh, you should judge and decide. Uh, of course, it's not a one-way street. I mean, some people argue that without Turkey, U.S. is going to, 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 to get lost there. No. Uh, if we can do anything good in that troubled region, anything good, it's going to be together. We cannot do it alone. This is what we look at this, uh, how we look at this relationship. And I'm very much optimistic that this relationship is equally important to both countries, you know, vice versa. It's important for Turkey. It's the number one country in our foreign policy. And I think it's important for the United States that this engagement in a healthy way should develop. Thank you very much. Mr.